This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment is brought to you by Binary Palette. I guess the bottom line for that is you want to defend at all levels because it's not a matter of if you're going to get hacked, it's it's <laughs> when. Welcome to the LabVIEW Experiment. I am your host, Sam Tigert from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. I am here today with Chris Clark. Uh, Chris has been around the library community for quite a while. In fact, you were one of the first alliance partners. That is true, from 1991. Wow, yeah, I didn't realize the program went back quite that far. Yeah, it was January, and it was 50 bucks, and I got this certificate, and I made a card, and it said, Chris Clark, Certified LabVIEW Consultant. And so some guy asked me, like, what does the certified mean? And I was like, I just paid him 50 bucks and got this form, you know, back from him. So, yeah. What year did they start the certification programs? I don't uh, I don't know that I remember that. Well, I don't know. I... It must have been like in the 2000s or I got mine in, I mean, I got a CLD and then I got a test and architect mm -hmm. and that was in 2002, but I don't know when the lab you once started. It must've been at least five years before that probably. Uh, yeah. I remember I got my CLA, I want to say like 2011, 2012. And at the time, like the, there were only like maybe like 20 in all of Pennsylvania. And I felt like I was like on top of the world or something. Well, there was one guy who was the test and architect. Yeah, because there were plenty of labby ones by that time. But I thought, oh, I could be the second test and architect. But then it, I think I was the fifth or something like that. But it was like a five-hour practical exam. And it was like, and I got up early like every day for like eight weeks to study for it. I didn't really know what to study. I just kept reworking all of the problems that they gave me over the years and stuff. So yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think they have a practical for that anymore. Hmm. But yeah, it was like, oh, this is going to be easy. And then, you know, four hours later, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, yeah, it? I remember stressing out a little bit over the CLA and the CLD exams. And then the PSC told me, he goes, oh, there's a bunch of guys at this, whatever, some alliance company is like, they all failed miserably because I was saying, oh, I just barely passed. And he was like, dude, these other five guys took it and they got like 10, you know, percent or something like that. I took the CLED and I definitely failed it. But I don't know why I took it because at the time, like I had done very little CBO stuff. I was like, oh, I was like, that's a nice feather to put in your cap. So I'll go do that. And uh, procrastinator, I was going to study like a day or two before the project or before the test. And this project came up at work and I didn't have any time to study. And so... And of course, it was one of those projects where like, we need it tomorrow. And then you turn in, they're like, yeah, we're actually not going to use it for another week. And I was like- You never hear from us again. you guys. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, that you you got me into the only CLA summit or architect. What the, the test what stand thing, yeah. Yeah, because I had the first ever test stand summit with it. No, no you didn't get me, me but you were there. Yeah, yeah. No, we hung out. That's it. That's it. I got me into it. Whatever. Yeah. That was the first and only one I think that they've done. So, and may it be the only one. I don't know. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Well, anyway, so yeah. So I, I worked at this failing defense company in San Carlos, California. And for the first five years, all the tests that we did were by hand. There was no software. And so that was in the late eighties. And so you write a procedure and it would say like, set the channel one of the scope to 10 volts and the channel two per one volt per square and initial the data sheet, you know, mm -hmm. and it was all this by hand stuff. So a guy came around, he had a, a LabVIEW ad. And then my friend Marty and I just like instantly like, oh man, we're going to get this. <laughs> so then the next year, some guy had a project he wanted and no one wanted to work for him. So I told him I'll do it, but you have to buy lab view and some DAC boards and stuff. So I got two sets of everything. So my friend Marty and I can both have a, have a set. And then later they were like, Hey, why did you get two sets? I was like, well, we need backup. You know, we need a backup set. <laughs> so that if we went to, uh, we met all the NI people at Macworld Expo because it was only on a Mac. Back yeah. Then. And so that's where we went. We got a demo there and they gave us, they, they were like, Hey, we need consultants. And we're like, we could never do that. You know, we're so lame. 
And they're like, oh, really? You can get 75 bucks an hour. And we're just like, you got to be kidding me. And yeah. so, you know, I worked for another year and then I was consultant for a year. And then I got had to get another job for about nine months. Uh, and then after that, like that was March of 93. So I went all the way to 2019. Um, and then I got a job at Ball Aerospace where I work now because I think I was just kind of burnt out. Yeah. And yeah, so back in the early days, there was this guy from Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Gary Johnson. He wrote the first LabVIEW book. And I remember the first user group meeting, he was there and he showed like, I always have a configuration panel for my programs. And I was like, so ever since then, it's expensive to write a good one, right? Yeah. So I noticed that like Fabiola and those guys have a framework for configuration. Mm -hmm. So I haven't checked that out or anything, but I thought, oh, that's that's the way you got to go, right? To have some some kind of framework. And so back then, Gary said they had hundreds of LabVIEW licenses at Lawrence Livermore National Labs where he worked. And he was a controls engineer and he and the other guys that worked there could program in LabVIEW and C. And he said that their metric was five to one LabVIEW to C. Like what you had take you five days to program in C, you could do a one day in LabVIEW. And so I don't really hear people talking about that kind of a metric anymore. The, I remember the user group meeting at Macworld Expo in 1992. There was a guy from JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and his presentation was they had these weird old tapes with like analog telemetry on it, and they wanted to decode them, so they had a bake-off. They had two LabVIEW guys against a team of six C, C++ programmers, and they, they time-boxed it. And then, so at the end, the LabVIEW guys had 110% done, and the C guys had like less than 20%. And so there was a, another identical story, like from this other company, Raynet, there. And so, I don't know, I, I always thought about it like, it's not that you can just do it faster, it's like you can spend more time and get a higher quality product, right? Yeah, in the same amount of time, if you spent the same amount of time, then you'd have more time to refine it and more time to... right. And to solve the customer's problem, yeah. You that's right. The customer is going to be happier. It's it's going to lower the total cost of ownership because yep. it's not going to be all hacked together and shortcutted and stuff like that. With the tech debt, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. How do you think about that now? Do people just talk about, I know, the NI guys are like productive, but I I've, I think that gap has narrowed, you know, one to five, maybe to one to two because the world is caught up and stuff like that, but... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like in LabVIEW, doing a lot... I think LabVIEW is slower than it used to be because people are doing more process around it now, more of the CICD and unit testing mm, and all these things. Right, 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 right. And those things work really well with text-based languages, and with LabVIEW, they don't work as well. And so then that slows you back down. I think that might be part of the slowdown. Yeah, and it's like in the beginning, it was like this huge excitement, you know, yeah. and everything kind of settles in, right? Yeah. Like asymptotically. But yeah, so for a while there, like in the in the nineties, it just seemed, you know, lab was just going like that. Yeah. And I could I just could never understand why people would want to write all this stuff from scratch. Like my thing is I, I like to work at a high level. Mm -hmm. I just want to get stuff off the shelf, modules and things like that, and maybe write some glue code to to put it mm -hmm. together. So that's just my personality. That's why I like test in and Things like that. And I've written, certainly written tons of, of code at all, you know, FPGA, real time, whatever, LabVIEW, then test management is, is test in. So that's just kind of, and so in the beginning, that's what LabVIEW was. I remember there were dudes around like in the late eighties, you know, trying to write some software. And then Marty set up, he had this VME crate and it had a GPIB board in it and he got it talking in LabVIEW when we first bought it and this manager came around and he's like how long did it take you to do that and he's like about 15 minutes and he's like took Lois a whole week you know and they were using yeah. Visual Basic or, or Radio yeah. Basic or something like that so yeah I, it seems like I still can't imagine writing an instrument driver in Python but I mean I I wrote a bunch of Python stuff over at CU a few years ago mm -hmm. It seemed pretty cool. One interesting thing that happened to me last week was at Ball, we have to use Ruby of mm -hmm. all things. And there's this open source test executive thing called Cosmos, and it's all based on Ruby. So anyway, I needed to multiply two arrays 
together. And so I, I thought, okay, where's the, the multiply thing, you know, like primitive, like in lab view. And I had to go out and Google that. There's no like scientific or engineering library for Ruby. Like, you know, there's that NumPy or yep. NumPy is. So I, I've never used that, but it, it, I have the impression that it, it's pretty solid and would have everything that LabVIEW has. So, I mean, that, so that's one of the things about LabVIEW. It's, it's made originally for engineers, right? Like the, the whole block diagram was like, oh, engineers speak in block, block diagrams. And so I read a bunch of stuff back then about end user programming. And there was a guy... Howard Gardner, and he had a couple books about multiple intelligences. Like some people prefer text, other people think better in images and stuff. So I was like, all like, oh yeah, this is LabVIEW. And I've met people who are like, there was a guy at Exabyte, and he was, I just briefly met him. He goes, I got another assignment, and I'm just going to write all a bunch of stuff and see. And I just so glad to get away from this LabVIEW thing. And I thought, ah. It's the multiple intelligences, you know, like some people just want to do the text better, but I don't know, but something about lab, you, you don't have to like have all these files. You just open up a diagram and start going. Right. So there were other papers back then about how lab you removed artificial complexity. And that was like a key thing. So these are all things that were like hot yeah. back then, but I don't, I don't see them around anymore. Well, the artificial complexity thing I definitely see because like running stuff in parallel, right? Like you drop two while loops in the block diagram in parallel and they run in parallel versus like trying to do that in Python or something requires jumping through some hoops. Absolutely. And you have to create threads. And yeah. So, back and forth and it's gonna be so I got my master's over at CU in interdisciplinary telecommunications. And I had, since it was interdisciplinary, I took three graduate level computer science courses. Mm -hmm. there, there was no coding or anything in that. But they talked about focus on the task at hand. You know, there's the task at hand and then information on demand. You get the information the way you want it at the right time, the right way, the right time, and the right format, whatever. Okay. That's the right way. There were three things, whatever. Anyway, so information on demand and the focus on the task at hand. And actually, that, that my VODIA mm -hmm. acronym was information on demand. And it, okay. I mean, it's the worst company name ever because it's a V. And it's, you can't pronounce it or anything, but it was all about vertical information on demand, like a oh. full stack from oh, okay. LabVIEW at the bottom and then the test management and the databases at the top. That's what I was envisioning. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, my original company name was System Automation Solutions, which is great till you try to get the domain and like, and you try to put on a business card and it doesn't fit. So Right on, right on. Yeah. yeah. So Beauty is like everything except, <laughs> yeah. How do you say yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Vyota is nice and short, at least. At you least that. that yeah. yeah, and it was... And easier to remember. Definitely. It is, it is unique. So. The domain is there, but yeah. I, I didn't ever really realize it had VI in it. Like, it was like 15 years later or something like that. I was like, hey, that's a VI thing. The clever one I like is the VI Kings out in... They're somewhere in Denmark or something. Oh. But it's spelled Vikings, but it's VI Kings. Oh, that's I cool. That was kind of cool. I haven't seen them. That was a cool name. Yeah, so... Let's see. So we, we were talking about the early days. What, what yeah. next? Yeah. Oh, well, I have something I wanted to talk about. So okay. when you were at CU, you, I, you had taken some security classes? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Because I think that's sure. something yeah, that yeah. like people in the lab you world don't know a whole lot about. Yeah. So sure. I would love to talk about that a little. So that's actually related to my master's, which I got in 99. <laughs> and I was over there. I don't know what I was doing. I was just like hanging around, you know, like this older creepy guy on the campus. And there was, no, I saw a poster and I went over to it and they were having a hackathon and the professor was from my program. And so he was chatting me all up like, hey, you should take my secure web app class. And he was the security professor yeah. from Carnegie Mellon. And I was like, okay, I will, you know, and I did. And then he was like, hey, you can get a certificate if you just take four classes. And I was like, I already have this one. Like I took that before. Okay. Can it? Can I count that? So I got three classes, and I, I don't know what it. You know, but it was like when I was a consultant, I still had the flexibility to go to the classes yeah. in the daytime. So I learned all Linux stuff, did PHP and Python, and I, I you know, I just I always knew that it would wasn't that bad, but I never had time to get into it, and it really is not that bad. So. When back in the LabVIEW five, they had this Internet Toolkit. And so my friend Marty that I worked with, it had a web 
server in it, and this guy, Stepan Rhea, wrote it. He was from NI, and he wanted to write something real, you know, with LabVIEW, just as an exercise. Mm -hmm. So it worked like a real web browser. It was a port of HTTPD, which was like an early Apache thing. So Marty made this whole big music sharing website. It was back in the dot-com bubble days and stuff, and he thought he was going to, you know, sell that or something like that. And I always thought, I bet you could just do it the regular way with Apache, and it's not that bad. And I never got around to it, but I finally did. And I figure, I mean, it was easier in a class because the TAs were there, and you could get help if you got yeah. stuck and stuff. But I did a whole, like, we went through this whole web app thing, which is, you know, a database with a web front end. And it was in LAMP, Linux, okay. Apache, uh, MySQL, yeah, and PHP. PHP. And PHP is really pretty cool. I know the one one of your podcasts I listened to was that B Bonito Bener Derek Bomarito Bomarito. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said he wrote a LabVIEW web browser, didn't yeah. he? Anyway, so you can just do it with PHP with the LAMP thing. I bought a a book, you know, learned LAMP in twenty four hours or whatever, and I went through the class and I did a my semester project was with one of my customers for, for managing their data. And I never really quite got it online for them, but I, it, it's it's all right there. So then it, that was my thing that I presented at the Test In Architect Summit. I kept getting these emails from them saying, we need presenters. And then after a while, I thought, I feel kind of sorry for them. And I thought, well, I could do this thing where you hook the web app up to Test In. And, and it was, that was the year of security, okay. right? Which you asked me about. Yeah. And so I said, well, I got this, I just did this secure web app and I can talk about security and, and the, I, the hook would be that you would use this front end for all the data you acquired with test and I think that's what it was. So it was pretty much of a stretch. So I went in, I did my thing. And then this guy from, what is it? System link. Mm -hmm. He came in and did a pitch for a system link. And I thought, oh crap, their thing is so polished and nice and stuff. But he did say, so I thought this is bad, you know. Because my thing is just what's like the bare bones. But he said, well, all our stuff is based on what this guy over here just presented. We just like packaged it and make it nice. So, I mean, if you were so inclined to do that, I mean, it's nice to have the system links and have them prepare all the stuff for you and I and, and make it yeah. nice. But if you want to get out of the, used to be the blue bubble. Yeah. Now the, the green, green bubble. If you, I mean, it's definitely tractable. It was, it was as I always thought. And so... At that summit, they all they talked about was man in the middle attack over the on the labby side. Remember, they were all trying to talk about security. But the main thing that has always there's a thing called OWASP mm -hmm. top ten. You know this. You know yeah. all the security. Oh, yeah, We've yeah, talked yeah. about this yeah. before. Yeah. So you can go there and uh, SQL injection, cross site scripting. Yeah, those have been the top yeah, two like, forever. Yeah. So I looked at it recently, and I noticed there was a new one in there, and it, it's it has. It's kind of, I don't remember what it was called, but it's about when you write your code, you can you can write your code in a way that's insecure. That, that Like memory bugs, like use after free and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. What's that to run over thing in the uh, bu memory buffer? Buffer overflow. Yeah. Buffer, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the original kind of yeah. hack things. But there's... There's other things, and that's what we learned about in that class, how to, like, because the SQL injection is, like, instead of entering your name and password, you you put a script in there, yeah. right? Bobby, it goes straight Bobby in drop there. tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, and the professor, like, emphasized that, you know, that, that the, all the companies he worked for, they had to train the developers, and when they did the CI, CD stuff, they, they just over and over, you have to go out and bitch at everyone about, like, guys, you know, you're doing this wrong and stuff. So I think that on the security front there, where, where I work now and where a lot of companies I have worked, you go in inside and it's inside the firewall and they have their real-time targets and their, whether it's Windows or real-time with PXI or CREO, they run it without a password on it. And that's just a no go, man. Yeah. And then are they it, they have every one of the machines with a password like password one. The same password, yeah. Or the yeah. password's the same as the username or like dumb things like that. Oh yeah. Now one of the things in the class they have these websites you could go to and all the IoT cameras and things that you could ever buy, they have all the default passwords there. And you can Google that. I did that at a job once actually, because I inherited this system and it had its own little router like inside their own corporate network. And I needed to change some settings and I couldn't get into it. So I just flipped it over and I clicked the model number. You were logged in like 10 seconds. I was like, I was man. surprised at how easy it was. 
I yeah. really felt like a, a real hacker, but it's like it's, yeah, it's like, it's like your T-shirt, International Spy Museum. Yeah, I got my T-shirt at the Stasi Museum. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. all black, like a yeah. blindfold. Or yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They don't want to identify themselves. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so you, I guess the bottom line for that is you want to defend at all levels because it's not a matter of if you're going to get hacked, it's it's yeah. when. And so in work, people are just going to say, what are you doing that for? Why did you make a long, weird password like that? And it's like. Yeah. Well, insider threats are a thing, right? Oh, yeah. So, like other governments and, uh, and hacker groups and stuff are trying to get employees on the inside. And I so often hear from like lab programs as well. Oh, it's it's inside our network. It's in this locked lab, so it's no big deal. But like anybody anywhere on your network can get into it, like a CVO that's like broadcasting a bunch of shared variables or something. Yeah, everyone should drop that attitude because they get in and then they move laterally, right? So yeah. if you got a bunch of unprotected stuff, you're just really not doing your job. Yeah, and a lot of like security is just removing the low hanging fruit. Some of it's not even that hard, like changing the default password. Like, Yeah, you just want to slow them down. Yeah. I mean, that's what the guy said in the classes. Like, you know, you just want to put as many obstacles yeah. up as you can, and it, and you, it's it's a good idea. Yeah, because there's always, like, nothing is ever 100% secure, so, like, if the CIA or the NSA wants to get in, they're going to find a way, but at least if you do all the low-hanging fruit, you, you keep out the script kiddies and the... They're, yeah, exactly. And the, the people who aren't very motivated. Yeah. Yeah, there's this really cool movie called Black Hat. I would re recommend it, Michael Mann. And in that movie, they're doing a lot of hacking, but the biggest hacks were the social engineering. Like they broke into the place yeah. and put a USB thing and they didn't like come through the network and stuff. People are always the weakest. Like, like I always thought like if you wanted to get into a building, just wait till like a lunch break when people are walking out and have a woman put on like a pregnant suit and like carry a big box and walk up to the door. I guarantee you somebody holds the door up before she walks right in. Right on. But, right, right? Like, it's just like that human nature is to want to help people, and it's so easy to trick people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Take advantage of people. Yeah. Did you know that the LabVIEW Experiment has a Patreon? All memberships include access to a private Discord server where you'll be able to chat with other fans. Benefits to membership include behind-the-scenes content and sneak peeks at new episodes, as well as opportunities to chat and even code with Sam. To learn more, check out our website, www.thelabviewexperiment.com. It's your contributions that keep our experiment going. Thanks. So. All right. So that that is that. And and uh, yeah, and then I met friends of mine who were doing a thing with InfluxDB, which is uh, so like as, as a high level guy, I'm looking for leverage wherever it can get it, right? So uh, it, it seems like there is these, like an MQTT broker, like mm -hmm. I think there's a couple things from JKI that they posted where they used that. Uh, so for people who don't know, what is MQTT? I know what it is, but do you? I don't know the exact, it's a broker. Okay. It's a, it's a standard for a broker. And yeah, so you it's have like a streams. message broker, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you have like streams of messages subscribe. and it forwards, yeah, publish and subscribe. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things that people build in LabVIEW, they may have a TCP server and like a bunch of TCP clients. And I just have this feeling that you could get one of these brokers and it would be much cleaner and more powerful and easier to understand because it would be documented. And, and so I'm, I'm not sure. Like, have, did you ever see that thing from Jack Dunaway called Featherweight? It, I have looked at it. I, I mean, it seemed like he was doing something like that, but I don't, it was just partial slides kind of left over. So anyway, the influx DB is is like just so awesome because you can set it up immediately, and there's a lot of people use time series data, right? Mm -hmm. And and you can just pour all this data in, and it just creates the schema, you know, when it when it goes in there. And so that seems like that would be super useful for many lab you job scenarios. Yeah. And I I think did you see that presentation I did? I did that at alarm like what's it been six years ago or something like yeah that. i don't remember that particular kind of one yeah, yeah i don't know yeah hopefully that wasn't me I no it wasn't i you. probably wasn't there no but i don't remember it so it could have been me but yeah so yeah so i think that's good on that on that topic there's there's just like with the the whole open source yeah reality i mean i think that kind of caught up with ni because they had this really cool libraries frameworks and tools and all this stuff and now there's a lot of libraries and frameworks and tools all over the place and stuff. But not, nothing beats an eye, of course. So in honor of the LabVIEW experiment, yeah. I thought 
I thought, oh, I don't have any lab experience. Like everything I did was an experiment, you know, right? But then, I, then stuff started coming to me. So Alan Smith and I, I there, there was a job at Sandia. And they, there was a guy at Sandia. He wanted to have a common test platform, CTP, right? And so Ed McConnell, the NI guys, mm-hmm. and Jamie Olive and David Bonal, th- those are the okay. two Albuquerque guys. They, I guess some big partner, like, billed 750 grand, and they made a whole, all LabVIEW system that didn't really do anything. <laughs> I mean, so that's what they told me. And so they said, well, you know, we might be able to use TestStand for this. And so this, I think this has a happy ending now with, with this thing that Nancy was talking about. And so they said, well, why don't you come down and, and talk to this guy? And and then so, but they needed to get funding. So there are all these stakeholders. It's a huge place, right? And so there was one guy, he wanted a common test platform and they thought, oh, we can use this guy's funding to advance our program or our project here. But he wanted something that an end user could program, right? So it wasn't just the framework, but they wanted to make it so that techs in the lab could build test yeah. sequences and scripts from. So this, so this concept is something that we, we talked about over at CU. And so I think the, the normal setup is like what we do or what I did as a, as a consultant. You have your expert software engineer. And then you have the domain expert, the guy at the company, yeah. and he doesn't program. And maybe they do, maybe yeah. they don't. Yeah. But the, I think the original thing from like the 60s or whatever is you would have some dude who's the domain expert and, and his programmer, and they, he would, they would communicate and iterate and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So there is a book called A Simple Matter of Programming. I think it's from 93 or something. So it's pretty old, Bonnie Nardi. And they said... They had this concept of end user programming. And I thought, oh, this is lab view, you know, because you don't have to know, you don't have to have a .h file and all yeah. this stuff, you know, you can just, it's a, it's a higher level thing. And, and so they, they went out and studied, they said, hey, w- there's a lot of people in the population that have the ability to program. That percentage of people that we estimate have the ability is, you know, like whatever percentage. and then, But the people who actually program is much lower. And they looked at, like, people who could keep really complex baseball scores and, like, knitting things. And Excel was a big thing. People yeah. build these intricate things in Excel, right? Yeah, it's amazing what you can do with Excel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing and scary. Yeah, I like this dude I knew in San Francisco. His whole job was writing Excel macros for a bank. You know, like yeah. he wore a tie and a suit and stuff. Anyway, so they... They came up with these barriers to programming, and the, the two that I can remember is people get stuck on control structures like loops and branching, and they also get stuck on building up higher level functionality from the the base primitives and stuff, and that that's what they identified. So these dudes, a couple of professors that see you, this one guy had this thing, this concept called DODE, Domain Oriented Design Environment. So uh, their their example was the kitchen designer, which I thought was a, a little weak. But basically, they were going to build up the higher level functionality for you into you know higher level primitives or blocks or whatever that you would program in. But they were all from your domain, things that you you knew how to do already. Like the thing I thought of was maybe an HVAC environment. Like yeah. you could you could program whole buildings and then execute yeah. it and stuff. And they would like just that. say turn on this fan, turn off that fan, turn on this chiller. Yeah, yeah. And it would be all in terms that you understood. Yeah. It would be a very narrow focus yeah. thing. Yeah, and under behind the scenes it would go and talk to whatever DAC and send Yeah, all the complexity the that's in there, yeah. right? And so and I thought, well what about, you know, like designing race car engines or something and and probably you could get that in SolidWorks, right? You yeah. just buy a pack and now all you're designing in this one domain. So at the time I thought, oh, this is like a, this is a dode, man, this yeah. thing at, at Sandia. And the guy who had the money, it was his idea to just have a window because he was a MATLAB program and just to have people write skippy commands. And that, that, and we're like, I don't know, it wasn't just me, but everyone was, was talking about it, but I was kind of, you know, biased down that. And I thought, well, that's, you know, pretty, I hate text-based things, and that doesn't seem to be high level at all, and it's like he, he, the skipping commands. So we thought we could do it in a test stand where you'd have a pallet of steps, and you would just drag them out, and they would execute in a row, right? And the steps were by configuration. They'd have a big, hairy configuration panel 
that will pop up when you drag it over there. And anyway, so we started, I mean, it had part of a framework, like that Alan came in and we had this arrangement where you had, you could have a list of all the equipment that was in the rack, you know, the instruments and that you could give it a name and that would be referenced in these, in these steps. But the thing that they said at CU, they really emphasized, like, if you were going to build this do domain oriented design environment, it's really expensive. It's yeah. just super expensive because you can imagine, you know, encapsulating all this yeah. stuff and getting it right, mm -hmm. you know. So we didn't really have the chance to rack up too big of a bill. You know, it went on for a yeah. while. And we, somehow we said, oh, we're going to use X controls. And the manager guy that was on it, oh. he just picked up, he's like, we don't want to do a science project here. You know, like, and he, yeah. he just, it just really bugged him, you know, that. The X control, it sounded like we were just going to like burn all this cash yeah. and goof around, you know, like a lot of people do that, like the heroic yeah. programmer. Yeah, yeah. And then and they leave like tons of tech debt behind. So I don't blame people yeah. for being suspicious. Well, they're the arsonist and then they're also the firefighter. There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sam, you <laughs> man. You're the man. That's funny. So, so anyway, that, that all got terminated. And the one thing that I was thinking about was this whole concept of the end user program because they kind of have that at ball somewhat they have a lot of people scripting mm -hmm. and and there you know there's a variety of skill levels and I just keep coming back to like you know the the best way that I see er, they've ever seen is like LabVIEW and test end. You know, so there's a high level test and aspect but there's this low level LabVIEW thing where you can just go in and, and do the thing that, that needs to be done. And you need a skilled practitioner for that. And the the alternative where you could put all your wood behind this uh, high-level programming in, environment mm -hmm. that, that a lot of people could use, that that's kind of like losing in my mind lately. Yeah. But anyway, so I thought, wow, that's kind of an interesting you know concept. And the one thing I saw that really made me Think of that. I looked at the Tester Act the company okay. website, and they have these. They have these. Oh, I didn't even. I don't even have it here. It was a case study, and it said something like, "Internally, this company estimated two years for twelve developers to do this project, and we did it with two developers in one year, or no, a year and a half, or something like that." And I just thought that that's it right there. You know, you've got your skilled practitioners that come with a framework. And they work in the old-fashioned way with the domain experts, and they're just going to do better than the just a, a bunch of people that are pretty good or self-taught or, or whatever like that. Yeah. And so it seemed like at the GDEFCON NA last summer, mm -hmm. Nancy was there, and she was talking about this thing that they have at NI. I can't remember what it was called, but it, you would build up these little tests or little blocks and then drag them into a some kind of a sequence thing like it was i don't know you do you know anything about it or no i'm not sure i must have missed that but it but there's like there's kind of a threshold that you go over between like smaller projects right in the lab and then there's product development and then you go all the way to production and of course you know you need the more powerful stuff in, in production well there is a lot of proliferation of like the no code low code type solutions, which I think is interesting because you bring the power of programming, like being able to tell a computer what to do to people who aren't necessarily like super programmers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you could go, if you go like with configuration based yeah. and then you button it up and then you can make your own sequence of yeah. things. That's pretty cool. When I worked at Westinghouse, we had this really complicated circuit board tester, but it basically ran in a text file that was a list of, uh, of steps. And so you'd list the step and then you would list the limits and and what uh, what it so it would be like measure this point yeah it should be vol measure voltage at this point and then it should be between these two numbers and there are a few other little commands in there and it worked well and you didn't have to be a programmer to to do that you just right. had to understand the different commands right right yeah i must have around 2000 i like i did i i did my first labby test executive and then some guy showed me test in and then I went back and forth between them for a long time. I was like, well, you know, testing is too hard. And then I was like, then I do a labby thing and I feel, oh, I just build them for writing yeah. a bunch of code that you get that comes off the shelf. Yeah, yeah, you're rebuilding test stand. Yeah, and it's like 
for me, the first thing I do when I talk to a customer is find out like, do you really need to have this custom code written? You know, like really make sure. Yeah. Have you tried? Have you checked everything out? Is there any other solution? Because it's really expensive. Yeah. And I, you know, it's just uncool to build people for stuff you could you could get. Yeah. Well, people talk a lot about no code. Like, if there's a way to solve the problem without writing any computer code, you're probably better off. Absolutely. Because all code just go, becomes obsolete at some point because the operating system changes or that language is no longer supported or there's a security bug or something. Like, you're always having to go back in and tweak it. And if you can do it with like a process or something, you're doing it in hardware or whatever, it's often better. Yeah, and I I used to talk to people, you know, they they want the the off the shelf, it's cheaper. Yeah. Right. And it and Microsoft is gonna keep revving Word and it's not gonna break all your files and stuff, right? Yeah. But it's kind of like fixed and people really want flexibility, right? Yeah. Which is custom code, which is like super expensive and, and goes obsolete as you just said. And, and I used to tell people like, hey, test and is solving. There's a tension between these two goals, yeah. right? And test and like, and it's not just test and, but, it, but a lot of things I think, but that's what made me think of it. They have all these little modules. Yeah. It's like you're getting a bucket of objects and you, and they, it comes, you know, with a, a couple examples of a framework and all put together, but each module is an off the shelf thing that they maintain. Yeah. And you can add your custom code, but it's kind of corralled, you know, into yeah. little spots. And I don't know, that's like the best solution I can think of for that problem. Yeah, it's kind of like a plugin architecture or something. Yeah, and they have all these plug points. It's just, yeah, it's just like LabVIEW object oriented, but they, it comes with all the plug points designed in. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that. And I, that Martin Fowler book about UML. Oh, it's yeah. Like a little book. Yeah, yeah. UML distilled or something. Yeah, okay. yeah, That's yeah. Really you, you always have, like, in your presentations, you you reference a lot of different books yeah. and, and things like that. So I'm really totally into that, you know, like yeah. at the academic, you know, like yeah. I like to take the classes and stuff, but I have a bunch of books. I always can't make it through them. All yeah, time. sometimes it's a chore. But there's just a little paragraph in there where he says, like, yeah, the object oriented, you have all these plug points and you can modify your code without changing the. Source code, right? It's like plug in, yeah. really. So yeah, cool. Binary Palette provides software development and consulting services for LabVIEW, Veristand, and TestStand-based systems. It is run by Ravi Benawal, a certified LabVIEW architect and LabVIEW champion with over two decades of experience in the NI ecosystem. Binary Palette is committed to crafting software and systems that increase user productivity and simplify workflows while making the experience enjoyable. Want a turnkey test system developed from the ground up? or existing systems upgraded? Looking to outsource your software development? Binary Palette is ready to help you drive your next project to success. Yeah, well, to bring us back around a little bit, you talked about domain, what was it, domain-oriented? Design environment. Yeah, so I've been reading this book called Secure by Design. So it's about security, but it talks about domain-driven design, which is very sounds very similar to what you're talking yes. about. Yes, Yeah, and it kind of made the point that, like, if you design the code, like, you can learn all the security tip tricks and stuff and like learn all about SQL injection and stuff. But if you just design the code really well to begin with and follow these domain driven design principles, it eliminates a lot of the problems. So like one of the examples I had is like if you're asking someone for a phone number, right? That's a text field. They can enter anything they want, right? So if you're worried about SQL injection, well, oh, well, you got to filter for certain things to make sure they can't do that, right? But if you're going to display it on a web page, you have to filter for other things. If you're going to do other things with, you know, and their point was, well, if you know from the domain that that should only contain nine numbers if you, or 10 numbers or whatever it is, you can just reject anything that doesn't have nine numbers. And then you've already, you just eliminate all those problems just by doing that one step. That's not even a security step. It's just making sure that that makes sense within the domain model. Yeah, totally, man. That's, that's, that's absolutely it. That's a great example. Yeah. So that class that I had, we'd like you had to do some filtering of anything that came in. Yep. And then if you read something from the database, you had to escape it all. Like yeah. you were you were filtering both yeah. ways. But then a lot of the frameworks that you can get, like Django and I don't know what yeah. all is out there. Yeah, Django. They, they have a lot of that built in. Actually, PHP, the language, has a lot of that built in. I had to go to a, a website that was purposely open to yeah. test a lot of those things because it's, pre, it's pretty yeah. locked down. But I think the... 
the attitude is like I'm going to defend at every level. You know, yeah. I'm not just going to rely on the PHP version 10 or whatever. I'm going to Defensive do what you say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that is very cool. So another thing that you said at, at one of your presentations was like you got to get the code in front of people early. Yeah. And so I love that. And and so I had this other class at CU. It was called the user interface design. But the guy had a little book. It's a textbook. He, I looked. He can still get it. And it was called Task-Centered User Interface Design. And one of the things they said was, hey, you know, the user interface is not, you don't spread it like peanut butter over your app at the end. You know, it's an integral, integrated yeah. part of the app. So I think of that as like task-centered design, yeah. you know, not user interface design. So it's a thing where you make, you list all these representative tasks in detail, then you make a mock-up or a prototype, and then you run the tasks through the to test it. I like that because because you're thinking then along the lines of not, it, it's thinking deeper about the problem. It's not, oh, I got to display all this stuff to the user. It's, you're thinking from the user's point of view, what are they trying to accomplish? Absolutely. And then you decide what to display to them. Yeah. As opposed they, to, I've got all this information. I'm just going to throw it at the user and vomit it all over and hope that they can figure it out. And it's going to look it. really nice. And so if you look at any of my UIs, they're they don't look great or anything, but I focus on that, supporting that. The task. usability, yeah. 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 To me, like the usability is much more important than the aesthetics. Like I, I do a little bit of the aesthetic stuff, but really it's it's the usability. It's like if I've got to accomplish this task, how many buttons do I have to click on? How many screens do I have to go through? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Any any little thing. And then there's so many unhappy users out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you can help them out. Yeah. Well, I worked on this one project and it had it was Processing soil samples, they had like four or five stations. And the guy who wrote the code, like he had like a conveyor belt type system to move stuff through. So he had one screen with all the motors. He had one screen with all the pumps, all the, right? But each station had its own pump and motor and thing. Oh, and and exactly. so, like the task to start the program was to go here, home all these motors, right? So why would you not just home the motors when the thing started up? Because you're going to want to do that anyway, right? So you had to go home all the motors and, and switch and make sure everything was in the right position. And then you could hit start. Right. And so I took it and I just broke it into tabs. I had one tab, one tab basically for each station. So you could like look at one station as an entirety and see, okay, the pump's doing this, the motor's doing that. Yeah. It made a lot more sense and it made it a lot easier to figure out what was going on. As opposed to like breaking it down by like all the Boolean inputs are here. Here's an array of 40 Boolean inputs. You figure out what they are and what they do. And, you know. Yeah. You got to be like kind of sensitive, you know, and just really really think about it and and the best one of the best so you can do it yourself like with this walkthrough kind of process or you could the best way is to get the end user feedback right and the yeah. best way to get feedback or, or the only way to get feedback is to give them the, the, the software yeah. and if you get it to them early enough you can identify some you know potentially huge things and the other thing that was really weird is they talked about this tacit communication and so a lot of times people will use the software that that I wrote for them. I mean, mostly smaller jobs, but I mean, I've done some huge jobs as well. But they'll, the, a couple of times people are like, they get the software and they can finally use it right. And they're like, well, we don't want this. And I think, but you told me you wanted that. You know, yeah. So they don't even know. So they it helps them the... Iterative process helps them learn, you know, what their business yeah. goals really are. Well, right? it's kind of like that. There's a drawing where there's like two people and the one guy says, okay, let's build a shape. And one thinks of a circle and one thinks of a square. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I got a shape. Let's go. Yeah, and yeah. They built some like Frankenstein shape. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. So I don't always get to, you know, realize that or whatever, but I, I try to... I try to work on that. And the, the other aspect is when people are giving me feedback over the years... I always feel really annoyed, and I, I don't know why why that is. You know, I guess it's because like I don't like your thing, but I override that, and and it's just invaluable to get the the feedback. So when you said that at one of your presentations, I was like, yeah, man. Yeah, you got to try hard not to take it personally, not become yeah. too attached to your code too. That's what I think. Like, there's an interesting. I listened to this presentation lady was talking about, and you know, like when a sculptor sculpts something, they start with like a block of marble, right, and they start removing things, and that the outcomes the sculpture, right. When we write code, we, we make a mistake. We think that when we're writing stuff, we're actually building the sculpture, but we're actually building the block of raw material, and then you chip away at it to get the sculpture, right? So you throw your your first draft is oh, not yeah. the sculpture. It's the block of marble, 
And then as you refine it, and as you talk to the users and get their opinion on what works and what doesn't, you're removing stuff and then you're like refining it into the sculpture, which is a totally different way of thinking about it. And it makes it a lot easier to get rid of stuff. Because I think as, as programmers, we're really reticent to get rid of stuff, which is really crazy because we have get and or SDN right. or whatever as a time machine to go back and get stuff. And yet we still, we draw disabled drops, blocks and we just leave the code there. That's right. And it's there. Oh, yeah. It's or there's like forever. dead code and it's just like, well, we don't want to get rid of that. Well, why would we get? And it's like, well, no, you can get that back. Like, it's not hard. There's a guy, I have a friend, Steve Eric. Do you know him? I've heard Steve that. Art. Yeah, he lives in Longmont. We we have a library toolkit together. And so I've known him for years. But he he had a, this friend in, in Boulder, and his name was Linwood Wilson. And he was like this older guy with white hair. I'm an older guy with just like whatever this Yeah, well, I'm a slightly younger guy, but I was getting he, some gray hair myself. But he, 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 Linwood Wilson rules of code optimization. Oh. Rule number one. Don't do it. Rule number two, if you must optimize your code, don't do it now. So I think that kind of seems a little yeah. related to what you're talking about. Yeah, well, I've always thought, like, make it work, then make it pretty, and then if you have to, do the optimization. Because sometimes, like, people prematurely optimize all kinds of things, and, like, sometimes you don't even know what the bottleneck is, so you run it, and you run it, and you see, oh, this is the bottleneck, right? It's never where you expected it. Yeah, you, you want to get the whole thing top to bottom and start yeah. getting the feedback, the iteration yeah. going. But I'm also a really big fan of, like, getting it work and get some unit tests in place so that then you know it works, and then as you're tweaking it and trying to optimize it, you know that it still works, so you can keep running the tests again. And that, that's, like, a really nice, like, a software vice, I think, is the way I've heard it referred to. Of like you just get you put this vice around it so like from the outside world it doesn't change at all but you can remodel the inside as much as you want. That yeah, yeah. I have never gotten that far. <laughs> I would I was I was thinking we would be doing that at my job now, but they there's a little bit but not not as much as I would they so hey room for improvement man. So my presentation did not rub off as much as I'd hoped it would. It, it's just uh, you know a fire drill. They yeah. just got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, and, the, and it, so that brings up a really great point. Is I think a lot of companies, you know, industrial, especially in, in aerospace, like all the big aerospace companies, like I've worked at Lockheed, and then there's Seeker in, in Denver and stuff. They don't understand software. Yeah, you know, they just I, I don't know what what it is, but they they don't can't understand that it's iterative, that you that it yeah. pays off to invest yeah. in the framework and invest in the unit testing and and all that infrastructure and stuff like that, and they. They're just piling up technical debt like it never stops, and they they can't even pay off the interest on it, right? And then and it, and it, you can see it it plain as day that the total cost of ownership just with that up yeah. yeah with that approach is always going to balloon. There was I was looking at Carnegie Mellon, I don't know what for, and I found this PSP document personal personal software process. Yeah. It's like if you're working alone, you can have your own process, but right in the abstract it says the right way to do a software job is always the cheapest and fastest yeah. way. And I was like, this is so classic, man. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Firefight. I see lots of people who are way too busy doing Firefight. Like I had this guy call me up and he wanted to meet to like talk about improving his process or stuff. He canceled like three times in a row. And at the last minute, he's like, oh, this thing came up at work. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So I was like, that tells me that you really need me, but you're not ready because there's no margin. You don't have time to work to improve. So I, I think you should always build margin in, you know, like, and I don't know how you do that. Like if you can't convince the management to build in, build it into your estimates. If something's going to take you seven hours, tell them eight. Oh, that's you know, what I did. Just that so last. that like you have a little bit of time. So, you know, sometimes you'll use that up for the program. Sometimes you'll get that extra time back and you're like, okay. And then you go invest in improving the process. Yeah. That guy hasn't hit bottom yet. Yeah. Yeah, I did Yeah, that. I told him, I said, what, once you hit bottom and finally decide to start swimming, give me a call. But like, you, you can't, I, I can't help people like that because like, I could come in and tell him all these things to do, but he's not going to do them because he doesn't have any time. It's, it's just got to break the cycle somehow. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what we're in. Yeah, yeah. It, it work. So I'm, that's like the, the most interesting thing, you know, I, I do now is like think of ways to, you know, make it, make some impact in the, in a large corporate environment yeah. that that is pretty chaotic and stuff. If you figure out that out, we ought to have another episode because I'm sure a bunch of people want to figure that out too. I, I am. I'm figuring it out. I'm going to figure it out. And, and so my my wife does executive function, function 
okay. coaching, okay, Catherine. And so she's into this, into many different authors and things, but this guy, Cal Newport, have you seen his? He does the, the focus stuff, Deep right? focus, Deep yeah. Focus. One, yeah I haven't read that, but I know about it, yeah. So that's one book. And so his books are kind of building. And so the, the latest one that has been published is A World Without Email. Ah. And so it's about workflow. And so the GDEFCON 3, how are we doing, by the way? Oh, we're good. Okay. So Jorg and Fabiola did the presentation about workflow, mm -hmm. right? And, and automating your software development workflow. But this world without email book is like the broader workflow. It doesn't have to only be software, but it fits really well. And so everyone's kind of running their life out of their inbox. Yes. Right? So you'd have this ad hoc, unstructured deluge of like task switching. All yeah, yeah. Place. And it's all urgent. Yeah. Very yeah. little of it's actually important. And and so the 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 top two productivity killers are being overloaded yep. and task switching. And the, and that's it. That's going to kill your productivity. So if you flip that and say, hey, man, if we can put together some chunks of uninterrupted work time mm -hmm. and we can corral this unstructured communication, yeah, there, there could be mass quantities of productivity that can be uncovered here. So that's super interesting. And it can, so like the first half of the book is about the problem. It's a lot of academic studies and stuff, and the second half is kind of about the solution. And and you could just kind of shortcut it and say, hey, it's going to be some form of a Kanban board yeah. or Agile process. And people can use, like, when Alan Smith and I were doing the thing at Sandia, he showed me how to do Agile Scrum, mm -hmm. and we just did it on a spreadsheet, like yeah. Excel. And he had a really nice slideshow and stuff. So then what it takes is, so they have this kind of example, like in the 1900s, there were manual labor dudes, right? Mm -hmm. And the management writer and consultant, Peter Drucker, yep. he he said in, in one of his books or papers or whatever, that the productivity of, of like manual factory worker kind of people mm -hmm. and stuff increased 50 times in the 20th century, 1900s, wow. right? And that that he and he the most outrageous claim was like that was responsible for all of the economic and social progress of that century <laughs> that productivity and so now in this century knowledge workers are at the same spot as they were in 1900 so if by using this workflow process optimization that's what's lacking right oh. now because the 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 knowledge worker determines how he does this, executes his work, right? Yeah. You can't just say, oh, yeah, you t twist this screw in. You, no one can tell him really how to do it. But there's a, they make this distinction, like, the knowledge worker should not, like, organize his time, and and that should be that should be part of the process of the company. And, man, so I'm in this new thing with this, this whole corporate thing, and I'm like, I think I'm spending a third of my time just like lining up what I'm going to do. Yeah. You know, like, oh, everything changed. And like, I have to rejigger that. And and really, it's amazing. So anyway, if people are wrestling with that, you know, trying to wring more productivity out, that that book is a killer one, a World Without Email. And then his next one is going to be called Slow Productivity. Mm -hmm. And so- Like slow and steady. Yeah, so this, yeah, you, you focus. I mean, the, the humans were just like cavemen, right? I mean, and everyone knows that your multitasking is not a thing. We're all single-threaded. And then the deep focus is about making time, you know, four-hour chunk or two-hour chunk yep. and stuff like that. And then the, the slow productivity is like you can't have a huge volume of all these different tasks. I mean, that's kind of what burned me out on consulting. You know, I always had like three or four projects going and, and yeah. various states of alarm, you know, and, and so it, it, that hasn't really changed much. If anything, it's yeah. worse like at the, at the big company, but uh, yeah, so you, you want to optimize the process and not optimize the person is the new thing. Oh yeah. And the, and the, so anyway. Build the system. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, I'm working with uh, some Kanban kind of tools like Trello was really good, but it's cloud-based. So we can't use that at, at work. So I have a lot of my stuff in it and it, and I, I'm, I'm making people do it, you know, in my tiny little group. And I kind of feel like I don't really know how to do this. I, yeah. I, I tried to, I, I don't know if, if you work in that area or not, but if, 
if anyone's interested in like having a user group or comparing notes, yeah, you could get a hold of me through Sam because that's the you know. So we we have the action items and the and the software tickets, you know, issues all kind of mixed together, and then, and then maybe it's worth having a small group of that together because I do that virtual coffee thing, and oh. Ruby was on there the other day, and he's been talking about like really? managing teams and stuff, and so that topic's been coming up a lot. So like, yeah, a, a working group of like LabVIEW programmers who are managing teams and how to manage teams and workflows and. Yeah, so I'm on. It's only that one aspect that I'm working on is the workflow yeah. part. But, okay, like cool. cool. Yeah. I will we'll have uh, to try to set something up. I'll show up. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, cool. Well, it's been great talking to you, Chris, and I always enjoy it. It's a good time, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you in Scotland again this year. Uh, yeah, for sure. GDevCon, and we got GDevCon NA coming up in uh, July, and uh, there's even one potentially in Australia in the works. So. That's crazy. Cool. But they are the best. All those GDev cons are so great. Yeah, great opportunity to get together and learn from other people. So, right on. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I, I really had fun. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment. <laughs>